Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes and allow people to log in. We had about 50 people register, so we are going to hold out for just a few minutes while we get some more participants. And we'll start shortly. Okay, it's just a couple of minutes after the hour, so I do want to get started today. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We want to talk about something very crucial to our chapter, and that is advocating for ALS in both the House and the Senate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about logistics before we get started. We have... Um, ability to record this webcast, so we will be recording today. If you have any questions as we go through our panelists and our speakers, just go ahead and type them into the Q&A. You should see the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Type them in and we'll try to answer as many as possible. And I'm going to ask Jackie to throw up that first slide right now of the map. I just want to give you a little bit of background before we proceed today. We are um, the Evergreen Chapter. As I mentioned, my name is Pauline Prue. I'm the Executive Director. And we serve about 850 people who have ALS in four states, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. We have the largest ALS chapter in the nation in square footage, which means we are represented by a large group of legislators, 22 legislators to be exact. Now, the size of our territory and just the sheer number of House and Senate members we work with poses a few challenges for our small but mighty chapter advocacy team. So I'm asking everyone on this webinar for a favor. And Jackie, if you could throw up that next slide. First off, please register with the ALS Association to be an ALS advocate. You can go to their website and complete a form and receive email action alerts. These alerts will notify you when to contact your House and Senate member. These alerts provide all the information you need. They even provide a script you can use. They make it really simple, and I'm asking everyone to go and sign up, and I can send that link out in uh, emails after this webinar. My second request is for you to consider joining the Evergreen Chapter Action Network. Our goal is to identify an ALS champ champion in each congressional district. Now we can have more than one champion, but we need at least one. And this person's job would be to reach out to his or her House and Senate members after they receive the ALS Association's action alerts. So that way we know that we are blanketing all of our House and Senate members in our territory with the ALS message. Now, if you're interested in joining this Evergreen Chapter Action Alert, please send me an email and I will send you more information. And at this point, I am going to introduce our first speaker. 
I am honored to have Abram Bilalkis with us today. Abram joined the ALS Association in 2017 and works with Kathleen Sheehan, Vice President of Public Policy, to lobby Congress and the administration on the association's various public policy priorities. Abram previously worked with the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, where he oversaw a national grassroots network and lobbied for increased cancer research funding. Abram also worked on Capitol Hill in both the US House and on the Senate side. Abram is going to talk to you a little bit about our past legislative successes, as well as this year's priorities. Abram, thank you so much for being here, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Again, you can ask questions in the Q&A function and we can have Abram answer them after he, he talks today. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Pauline. Can you hear me? All right, perfect. A vital question nowadays is everything is remote and we're trying to figure out technology together. Well, thank you all so much for, for joining us. I'm really excited to be speaking with you all today about um, our ALS Association accomplishments and our priorities for this year and this Congress. Um, and I'm really excited just to kick off things straight from the bat. We've actually have a very recent accomplishment that I wasn't even able to get up on the slide today. Um, just about a couple hours ago, President Biden signed into law what is called a technical fix to um, the ALS Disability Insurance Access Act, which is the first bullet up here that we passed last year. Um, and it made SSDI benefits retroactive for all people with ALS. So as of today, no person with ALS should be on the waiting list for SSDI benefits if they're eligible. And so the ALS Disability Insurance Access Act, which passed last year, before this technical fix was, was signed into law today, only people with ALS who applied after December 23rd, 2020 were eligible. Now everybody is even if they applied before then. So if you're not, if you're currently waiting for SSDI, I encourage you to go to als.org forward slash blog and then select the advocacy checkbox so that you can filter by those topics and you'll see a, a great FAQ there for how to access those benefits. But aside from this incredible win last year that was this SSDI benefit waiver, we were also successful in boosting funding for the ALS research program at the Department of Defense by doubling it from 20 million to 40 million, doubling it for the second time in two years. The year prior, we doubled it from 10 to 20 million. That is incredible, and it's thanks to all the advocacy of all of you out there. Um, and, and that is why we need you all to register at the Evergreen chapter to help us cover all of those congressional districts. Another example is boosting funding for NIH to 83 million um, up to 105 million in 2019. That's also huge. NIH is the largest funder of ALS research in the world. And we also uh, removed non-invasive ventilators from CMS's competitive bidding program, which would have made it impossible for people with ALS to access uh, support from respiratory therapists to actually use those devices. And so last year was quite a busy year, lots of successes and all due to all of your efforts. So let me see if I can make this go forward. All right, and so into our priorities for this year. So uh, we have a bigger agenda than we have ever had before. Um, and they roughly, each thing roughly falls into these five buckets. The first one is accelerating development approval and access to effective new treatments. And that includes the accelerating access to critical therapies for ALS or ACT for ALS Act and the Promising Pathway Act. And I'll get in a little bit to, um, of those to a little bit more in just a moment, but we are thrilled to be supporting those bills and are gonna be fighting hard to make sure that they become law. Next is increasing federal funding for ALS research. That's the annual appropriations process. And that's how we were able to double funding for the DOD program and for increasing that, that level of funding for NIH. So we're always gonna be focused on that every single year. We need more research in order to identify biomarkers, treatments, and cures. Next is making sure that people with ALS and their families have the highest, most affordable, most accessible healthcare that there is. And that includes protecting pre-existing conditions protections under the Affordable Care Act, uh, increasing access to durable medical equipment like non-invasive ventilators, like complex rehab uh, technology and wheelchairs, and also medications. Um, also permanently extending access to telehealth. That's been essential to providing access to medical care and to clinical trials throughout the pandemic. And that's something that shouldn't stop. 
And finally, um, increasing benefits for veterans with ALS and their families. So um, getting a little bit more into one of our first priorities within that first bucket of, of really drug development, um, we want to see the Act for ALS reintroduced and passed as soon as possible. The Act for ALS uh, in a nutshell authorizes $100 million every year for five years. So for a total of $500 million for four different components. This money would be used to fund new ALS research at the Food and Drug Administration that would increase the number of clinical trials, look into how to increase innovation, uh, patient um, input on the trials, you name it, uh, really creating some new innovative clinical trials. Uh, the next is a novel idea, which is a new grant system to provide access to experimental therapies. Unfortunately, the current drug approval process um, it doesn't provide access to experimental drugs uh, in many circumstances at all prior to their approval uh, by the FDA, and, and that needs to change, especially for ALS, and so this bill would provide some money to provide that opportunity. Next, it would create the first federal entity explicitly charged with developing treatments for neurodegenerative diseases, so there is no part of the federal government that's explicitly focused on this in the neurospace. So this would be essential to pushing forward um, drug development. And then finally, it would create an action plan um, to accelerate the fight for all these neurodegenerative diseases. The next one is the Promising Pathway Act, and that creates a new provisional approval pathway at FDA for rare diseases. And that has the potential to facilitate earlier access prior to full FDA approval. So drug sponsors would be able to market the drugs for rare diseases like ALS while continued testing takes place. This is essential because like I mentioned, there are very limited chances to get access to experimental treatments under the current system um, and making sure that FDA is fully funded uh, and provided with all the staff they need and all of the regulatory authority they need to accelerate drug development and be flexible in this way is absolutely essential. And so the Promising Pathway Act would create that new pathway that would simultaneously provide, potentially provide access to experimental therapies while studies continue. And this is something that has been very successful in Canada, in the European Union, in Australia, and there's no reason why it can't be successful here. Next is the biggest bucket, and this is what we are currently focused on because the annual appropriations process is happening right now, um, and that is to increase funding for ALS research across the board. And so we were extremely excited to be pursuing this new, some new requests and increased requests across the board. So first, we're seeking at least 130 million for ALS research at NIH at least 60 million for ALS research at the Department of Defense's ALS research program. So that's a $20 million increase over last year. Uh, continued funding at 10 million for the CDC's National ALS Registry and Biorepository. And then one of our new requests is at least 50 million for ALS research at the FDA's Orphan Products Grants Program. And then also a million to commission a new National Academy of study on making ALS a local disease. And I'm gonna go into each of those now. So NIH is incredibly important because it is the largest funder of ALS research in, in the world. Um, in fiscal year 21, it provided $102 million uh, estimated of ALS research. And it, it is primarily focused on biology genet and genetics research and to a lesser extent, uh, risks and causes and treatment development, but it's really kind of the hub for the most basic research that's then picked up and taken into clinical trials through other programs. Um, and so it's, it's incredibly important that there be continued funding and increases in funding at NIH in order to support um, additional, uh, additional research in that, in that arena. And so um, it accelerates the discovery and development of new treatments and and an extremely important goal is increasing the number of clinical trials. One of the top priorities of all of these appropriations requests is increasing the number of shots on target, if you will, in order to increase the number of trials, the number of treatments that are available, and ultimately a cure. The ALS research program is incredibly important because it's the only federal funding that's specifically kind of earmarked for ALS, the only disease-specific funding for ALS research. 
And that's incredibly important when compared to NIH, which is site specific, not necessarily disease specific. So it could be on the brain, could be neurological in general, but not necessarily ALS specific. Um, the focus of the program is currently on preclinical research at the very early stages. And actually, thanks to increased funding last year, thanks to that doubled funding we were able to secure for the first time ever, they are going to be funding their first phase one clinical trials, which is huge. Um, phase one clinical trials are all about safety. And the reason that we're looking to get 60 million this year, another 20 million increases so that that program can not just fund preclinical and phase one, but also phase two, which gets into whether a treatment is actually effective. And so we want the program to be funding the gambit of those three different phases, preclinical phase one and phase two. And in order to do that, we need $60 million um, to build on that solid foundation of preclinical research that the program funds. And another important note is that uh, veterans are up to twice as likely to develop ALS. And so that was the genesis of this program. After that finding, they created this program to look into this. And since then it's expanded into these other areas. Next is the National ALS Registry and Biorepository. Uh, something that a lot of people don't know about the, the, the registry is that it funds its own unique research. It is the kind of, it's the program that's going to find out what the risks are, what the causes are for ALS out of every other federal funding stream. It's uniquely looking at risk factors and environmental factors and Continued funding is essential to making sure that, that that progress continues to get made. There just isn't another federal agency that does the amount and focus of that kind of federal work. But it also collects biosamples, connects people with ALS to clinical trials, and measures incidence and prevalence. So we want to see continued funding there. We also have two new asks that I mentioned. The first is that $50 million for the FDA's Orphan Products Grants Program, and then the NAS study. And I'm going to go into more of that right now. So our new requests. And in order to kind of give you all a foundation for where these requests are, I hope you can kind of see my cursor. But if not, I'm over here on the left side of the page at Biology and Genetics of ALS, Risk Factors and Causes. So top left, Biology and Genetics of ALS, that's kind of NIH's area. And when I'm saying NIH's area and kind of assigning different agencies to the different portfolios here, it's in general terms. Uh, NIH funds things across all of these portfolios. But just to kind of give you guys a uh, better idea of where most of the funding is as it aligns with the federal programs that are out there, in general, NIH is mostly focused on biology and genetics of ALS. Um, the CDC right below it is focused on risk and causes of ALS. Preclinical drug discovery and biomarker research, that's the DOD ALSRP. And then this new area, this phase one, phase two, phase three, I just mentioned that um, ALSRP is now not just going to be doing preclinical drug discovery and biomarker research. Thanks to this increased funding, they're actually going to start directly funding these phase one trials. Um, but where these, this phase one or phase two and phase three are, that's where the FDA Orphan Products Grants Program comes in. And that's one of our new requests. So OPGP is Orphan Products Grants Program. Orphan Products Grants Program is really unique in that it funds well-controlled, efficient, and innovative clinical studies that evaluate safety and efficacy of disease treatments for rare diseases. It is funding clinical trials. And as I mentioned, we need more shots on target in order to identify what works, what doesn't, and the only way to do that is to increase the number of clinical trials. And so the reason that we're seeking such aggressive increased funding across the board, across federal programs, it is because we need to increase the number of clinical trials in order to increase the number of options and, and shots on target until we hit something um, that we know is gonna be effective and help people with ALS. The program has actually already funded six ALS clinical studies. <laughs> I honestly am not the researcher of the bunch. Um, I hope that you all know what BCA and gabapentin and all of this are. I don't really know a whole lot about um, any of those, but those are just some examples of, of the trials that they've funded. And if we're able to provide 50 million just for ALS, and so keep in mind that the Orphan Products Grants Program is currently funding research for all orphan diseases, which are any disease 
in the United States that impacts fewer than 200,000 people, those are called orphan diseases. And so this program is not just funding ALS research right now, and it hasn't funded much of it, but we want to increase funding just for ALS to 50 million in order for them to provide funding for ALS clinical trials to really fund innovative studies and regulatory science that pulls through all of that promising preclinical research through phase one, through phase two, and through phase three to those confirmatory studies that actually prove efficacy. And so this program is just essential and it's very complementary and non-duplicative of the rest of the funding that um, is taking place, whether it be by the ALS Association, uh, any of the private sector, any of the, of the other federal agencies out there. All right, so Orphan Products Grants Program has resulted in larger phase three randomized double-blind placebo controlled with 245 participants. And so kind of the line here that you wanna be thinking is this funding equals more opportunity for people with ALS to participate in clinical trials. We, we increase the number of clinical trials through the program or through the ALS research program. We increase the number of opportunities for people with ALS to participate in clinical trials to have that hope, to have that potential to have um, access to new therapies that, that might be able to help them. Uh, and more funding is needed in order to fund that phase two, phase three through the program and ensure that people are able to participate in an innovative way, that trials are designed innovatively in order to maximize participation, minimize burden, um, you name it. Finally is the National Academies of Sciences study on ALS. And so this, this last, uh, you know, a million dollars doesn't seem like a lot, but it is for, for this study. So a, uh, an independent National Academy study would identify and recommend actions and policy recommendations for the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to make ALS a livable disease within a decade. And that can mean many things to many different people, um, but there are specifics that we're looking to pursue that I'll get into just a minute here. Um, but it's really a comprehensive assessment of what the needs are given significant adverse physical, financial, psychological impact on ALS individuals and families. Um, it has an outsized impact on not just research and everything like that, but also kind of the gambit of care, care services delivery, um, veterans benefits, everything like that. And so to put this into perspective, the National Academies actually did a study on the connection between ALS and the military in 2006. And that report resulted in the Department of Veterans Affairs establishing a presumption of disability due to military service for ALS which opened a huge amount of additional benefits for veterans who have ALS. Essentially, Veterans Affairs recognizes that people, veterans who get ALS got it because of their military service and a bunch of benefits open to them that would have not otherwise been available. So it's had a lot of impact and we're looking to duplicate that impact across the, the, the board, whether it be care services, research, uh, drug development, in order to engage and enroll the federal government, uh, industry, and pharmaceutical companies and other nonprofits in this longer term, larger goal of making ALS a global disease. Um, and so it has an outsized importance. It's not a lot of money, but it's gonna make a big impact on the ALS community. So um, this is our advocacy team here in DC. Kathleen Sheehan is our Vice President of Public Policy. Um, as, as Pauline mentioned at the beginning, there is me. I had a lot more hair back then and I'm really missing it, um, but hopefully the new look is good. Um, and then Ashley Smith is our Associate Director of Grassroots Advocacy. So she leads all of our engagement opportunities. If you're signed up as we hope you will be at als.org forward slash advocacy as an advocate, you'll get all of our action alerts in the most timely manner so that you can have an impact on the process. Um, and then Adam Baker, who's our Manager of Public Policy Initiatives who leads our efforts on the CDC registry. So uh, I'm gonna turn things back over to Pauline. I just ran through that Pauline and there was a lot of content in there. So I'm foreseeing that there's gonna be a, a bunch of questions. I don't know if we're doing questions now or if we're gonna do questions at the end after other folks have a chance to present, but thank well, you so much for your time. Steph, Steph did have a really good question that I wanted to throw out. I mean, it's mostly directed to you, Abram, anyway. I'm curious yeah. how we can find out about the research that the DOD is doing with the funds they are receiving. 
do they publish their work anywhere that we can find it? Yes, absolutely. So um, all of the funding is, or rather all of the projects that they fund is available on the ALSRP's website. So if you just Google ALS Research Program Department of Defense, there's an ALSRP website um, and you should just be able to choose uh, from you know, their grant section um, to look up the kinds of studies that they're funding. But they did announce in their new uh, kind of program overview strategic plan for the year, um, this new uh, me grant mechanism for phase one trials, which is completely new. And it's thanks to that increase to 40 million that that was possible. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that answers your question, Steph. If not, just type back into the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you, Abram. I'm gonna turn it over to our second speaker now. Jean is the president of the ALS Association Evergreen Chapter, and she also chairs the Advocacy Committee. And fun fact, in 2017, Jean won the National ALS Association's Rasmussen Advocate of the Year Award, which is presented periodically to the individual whose personal efforts increase awareness in the local, state, or federal level. So Jean is very humble and very modest, but she is really an advocating powerhouse. And with that, I'd like to just turn it over to Jean so she can talk about her perspective as a local ALS advocate. Okay, I'm unmuted now, right? You are unmuted. We can't see you, but you are unmuted. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Jean Gronwald. I've been a volunteer for the Evergreen Chapter for over 10 years and an advocate for the ALS Association for eight years. This is my husband, Ken, and he's the reason that I'm here today. This picture was taken on his final flight with Alaska Airlines in 2008 when he was diagnosed with ALS just about a year later. Ken was an Air Force veteran and he was seen at the Seattle VA as well as the Virginia Mason for the four years that he was sick. He passed away in July of 2013 due to respiratory failure. When he died, I just felt a very deep need to do something about this horrible disease. At the Seattle Walk to Defeat ALS that fall, I had a visit with Becky Moore, who at that time was the executive director of the Evergreen Chapter. We talked about the lack of awareness of ALS in the general public, and I also mentioned to her that I was troubled with the disability grant program at the VA and how even the VA policies seem to overlook the disabilities that ALS caused. The eligibility, for example, for the transportation grant was loss of a limb. Ken had had bulbar onset of ALS and lost to speech and swallow very early on, followed quickly by the inability to hold up his head despite the fact that he could still walk and use his arms. In this picture, you can see the device that he invented to hold his head up when he was walking. He was in a wheelchair for a year because of that, but he didn't fit the criteria for the grant. Becky's response was, well, let's try to do something about it and thus began my initiation into advocacy. I had never had a reason or need to fully appreciate the access that we as private citizens have to our government. Beckley, Becky quickly arranged a meeting with a staffer in Senator Murray's office in Seattle, and she in turn connected me with a staffer in DC. He helped me to connect with a staffer in the office of Senator Bernie Sanders, who was the ranking member on the Senate Committee for Veterans Affairs. It was also suggested that I write to Secretary of Veterans Affairs Shinseki and Senator Murray herself wrote to Secretary Shinseki to request his attention to the matter. But he was embattled in a scandal at the time and nothing came of this correspondence, unfortunately. Early in 2014, Becky encouraged me to attend the ALS Association Advocacy Conference in May. And we hoped that I might be able to make further connections with the Sanders office or the VA while we were there in DC. That was my first year and my two daughters, Annie and Laura attended with me as well. It was a watershed moment for all of us. The conference is a three day event with a gathering of the ALS community from across the country. Hundreds attend, representing the 39 chapters of the ALS Association and usually at least 100 very courageous, courageous pals. 
I should add that last year we had our, all of our meetings virtually. Every year that I have gone, the conference has kicked off with remarkable speakers who breathe an air of optimism and hope into the mission of the ALS Association. There follows a time of training for our legislative meetings. And you can see from Abram's presentation today that the ter terminology and the content can be very overwhelming. But the national staff has really fine-tuned the information that we are given before a visit so that it is simplified and understandable. They do a very good job of preparing even rank beginners for these legislative visits. Appointments are all pre-arranged by the national staff. And ahead of our meetings, all of the offices of our Senate and House members receive packets with information about ALS, the work and mission of the ALS Association, and briefs on all of the issues and all of our asks before our arrival. The what and the how of our requests are all laid out for members and their staff. Our job is to provide the why and to paint a tangible picture of ALS and the impact of public policy on PALS and also the importance of the research supported by the appropriations asks. If everyone does their homework, the meetings can be very substantive. In 2014, one of the issues that was on our agenda had to do with a Medicare decision about speech devices that would have been extremely detrimental to PALS, much like the non-invasive ventilator issue last year. By sheer dumb luck, I had taken along Ken's iPad with his text-to-speech program on it. So we conducted a good part of our visits with his computer in his own voice. It was very emotional, but it was a way of saying a lot with very few words and extremely meaningful. The meetings go very fast. You have to pack a lot into a short time. It's true that anything visual is worth a thousand words. Since then, we have taken pictures with us every year and it's made a huge difference in presenting the need for our asks. In 2014, we also did not have the benefit of the ice bucket challenge, which happened later that summer. So we spent a good deal of time explaining ALS itself, which is something that we rarely have to do anymore. By contrast, I'd like to circle back to the VA grant issue and meeting that we had set up with Senator Sanders staffer, which we had before the conference began. It was a complete disaster. None of us was prepared. Despite our correspondence over three months explaining the purpose of our visit, he still had no idea what ALS was. He had not done his homework. I had no pictures. I told him that Ken couldn't hold up his head and his response was, you're kidding, which was understandable, but not helpful. But when I got back home from the conference, the social worker from the Seattle VA had contacted me to let me know that the VA was tweaking their disability housing grant and he sent me a document that had been prepared by six individuals with the, within the VA in support of the changes. I went back to the drawing board and set about putting to work what we'd learned at the conference. I wrote, rewrote the letter that we had previously sent out, making it more concise, and I included pictures of Ken's predicament in his wheelchair. I sent these letters to each of the individuals whose names appeared in the document. The ice bucket challenge happened in August. ALS was suddenly very much in the public discussion. In September, just three months after those letters went out and one year after we started this project, I received a letter from General Allison Hickey, whose title was Undersecretary for Benefits in the Veterans Department. Of course, we'd never heard of her before. One of those recipients had to have forwarded my letter to her. She thanked me for bringing this oversight to her attention and said that they were amending the eligibility for both grants to include ALS. Additionally, they made vets available, eligible upon diagnosis and not progression. The policy went into effect in January of 2015. It's been a great blessing for our vets with ALS, and it's a testimony to getting a clear message to the right person by any means. And for me personally, it gave purpose to all that Ken had gone through. 
In the eight years that I've been able to do this, every single legislative issue that we have brought before Congress has passed and every appropriation has been approved. Perhaps the most satisfying was the passage of the SSDI Act last year, waiving that five month waiting period, which passed last fall after a four year gargantuan effort. The ALS Association has been incredibly successful at advocating for PALS. I'm grateful that I've been able to be a part of it. I'm very proud of the contribution that the Evergreen chapter has made consistently. And I'm also extremely grateful to the legislators from our four states for their overwhelming support. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And you can see why we need ALS advocates like Jean. I mean, really bring the stories um, of what the PALS are dealing with to the legislators, especially through pictures and through these just personal stories. They, um, they are the heart of, of what we're trying to do. Our last speaker is Rebecca Alcorn. And I just saw you pop up, Rebecca, so I know you're here. Rebecca is the senior policy advisor for Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho. And Rebecca is going to share some of the keys of having a successful meeting with your member of Congress. Rebecca? Hi, uh, sorry, it took me a moment to unmute my audio. So um, I was really thankful I got to listen to your story, Jean. That was very impactful. Um, so I'm uh, the senior policy advisor for Senator Mike Crapo. I handle several matters, including healthcare issues. Um, and I'm just going to share some of my tips for a successful meeting with your legislature, legislator. Um, so a little bit on my background, um, more in depth, is I actually started on the House side. Um, I did healthcare policy for a congresswoman before coming over as a legislative correspondent to Senator Mike Crapo. So I can share a little bit of my bicameral experience with you. Um, and I think that's just a helpful perspective. So the first thing that you'd like to do is make sure to plan ahead, find out which staffer. Um, I think it might have skipped ahead, but find out which staffer is responsible for the issues you want to talk about. So in this case, it would be healthcare and reach out to them or uh, reach out to uh, the senator or representative scheduler if you'd like to try to get a meeting with them. Sometimes you're not able to get that meeting just because of time limitations, but it's always worth a shot. I know Senator Crapo likes to meet with um, all the Idahoans he can. And then the next part is I recommend sending talking points or the issues you'd like to discuss ahead of time. Oftentimes organizations will do that for you, but it's always worth double checking um, just to make sure they send it. That helps us as staff familiarize ourselves with the issues and it helps um, us prepare the Senator or representative. Um, and be direct with your ass. That's your first opportunity to, um, to say exactly what you want. Go ahead and ask for those things then, whether it's signing a letter or joining a bill, and I'll talk more about those specifics later. Um, so in a congressional office, uh, you may meet with a number of folks. As I mentioned, you might meet with the Senator or representative. You might also meet with legislative director. Um, or a policy advisor or legislative assistant or legislative aide or, correspond or correspondent. I want to emphasize that these are all members of the same team. So whoever you meet with, they'll take plenty of notes, make sure it works this way to the Senator or representative. Um, and another thing I wanna mention is almost everybody in this chain has a specific portfolio with the exception of the Senator representative of course, so you might meet with a legislative aide whose primary responsibility is healthcare appropriations or matters pertaining to the FDA, or you might meet with the legislative director who oversees the entire portfolio, or you might meet with a legislative assistant who covers all matters pertaining to healthcare, education, labor, and pensions, um, which is the health committee. But either way, all your all those things you discuss will make make us way back to the senator and to the staff that needs to review the issues. So in the meeting, um, you really wanna make sure you make your time count. 
time is often limited, especially if you're meeting with that member. So make sure to keep those introductions brief. And if, you, if you've sent your talking points ahead of time, keep it conversational in the meeting and tell us personal story about why this issue is important to you. I know for me, that's the thing I remember most is hearing that personal connection. And I love to hear how things we can do in DC can impact individuals uh, at the state level. And make sure to ask for support. That seems self-evident, but again, don't be shy about those ask. And finally, I recommend closing out the conversation with an offer to continue the dialogue. Too often, uh, these in-person meetings end with that final conversation. Um, and so that's why I emphasize closing out the dialogue. And I'll talk more about that later. But while you're in the meeting, um, you're going to encounter lots of new new terms. So you might ask a senator to sponsor, which means to lead and introduce a bill or co-sponsor a bill. So he'll offer his support or her support to another senator's bill and sign on formally as a co-sponsor. Or you might, uh, might be asking that your legislature legislator join a letter to the administration on a proposed rule or regulation. Um, and finally, one of the biggest asks we get is appropriations requests. That's where you might hear these terms, sign on letter or dear colleague. Those are internal letters um, and it's ways for senators to get other senators behind them with support. So funding for the NIH, for example. And you're not expected at all to know these terms. Um, we as staff have to go through the learning process here. So I recommend if there's something unfamiliar, raising that issue with the organization you're working with or, or talking about it with us in the meeting candidly, we're here to be helpful to you all as well. And so finally, I, I mentioned briefly, don't let the meeting end after that in-person or virtual or phone call or Skype meeting, stay on our radar. Um, send us thank you notes, we love those, but I recommend in today's world, just send us a quick email. Um, and that way you can reiterate your issues. And if you meet with the center representative, you can also send a handwritten note on top of that. Um, another thing that I didn't include here, but I'd like to just emphasize is we all have state and district staff. And while we'd love to meet with you when you're back, we're in the state or the district, since many of us work out of DC, I also recommend making those connections with your state staff because they're the closest to home and they can serve as a bridge between between the state and DC. And it's just great to know everybody in the office who can help you out on, on issues, especially if you have a casework issue that comes up. And that's my presentation. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Right now, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So I do wanna go back to um, my request to have everybody become an ALS advocate, go to the ALS's website and register as an advocate. You'll receive those action alerts. Rebecca talked about, you know, make sure you send your talking points. And I can tell you from experience, the ALS Association does a wonderful job as far as getting you prepared for those meetings. So register as an ALS advocate. If you would like to be part of our Evergreen Chapter Action Network and be a point person in your congressional district, please reach out to me with an email, pauline at elsa-ec.org. And we are putting together this action network. We're really excited about it and we're hoping to get um, a person from every one of our congressional districts. With that, I am going to open it up to the panel and see if they have any closing thoughts. Um, I wanna thank all of our speakers for being here today. Um, again, thank you for joining us. This is a really crucial topic for our, um, for our chapter. And to answer Jeff's question, yes, the Action Network is a new effort. That is something that we are targeting to have a, uh, an advocate and ALS champion advocate in every one of our congressional districts. And we just feel like it will be so much easier when the ALS Association sends us those um, alerts to know that you have your person that you're reaching out to and we will cover our entire territory and make sure that ALS message is heard. So thank you very much. Um, Abram or Rebecca, Jean, anything to add before we sign off? 
Well, I just really want to thank you for, for having us and giving us the chance to speak to folks. Um, I, I, I couldn't really say it better myself, Pauline. Really, please do um, join our efforts at als.org forward slash advocacy, where you can sign up um, on the Advocacy Action Center to receive our, our updates and our um, action alerts. I would just flag for you that one of the terms that Rebecca mentioned, the Dear Colleague Letter, um, a letter that circulated amongst members of Congress to build support for uh, legislative priorities of theirs, whether it's trying to get members to sign onto a bill or currently to support appropriations requests for specific uh, research programs. That, that process just kicked off. It happens every year around this time. Um, it's always sort of delayed. Um, but I would just flag for you that the annual ALS appropriations, dear colleague letter is currently circulating in the House of Representatives. Um, and that, that letter is currently open for signature by members of the House. So please do encourage your representatives to sign on to that letter. You can take action and send a letter to them on the Action Center. So again, ALS.org forward slash advocacy sign up for our advocacy alerts and you should be able to just complete that action right there on the website. Um, we could really use your help and hopefully together we'll be able to achieve these aggressive priorities that we have for the next year. Um, so thank you again for having me and looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Pauline, I, I had a comment um, about the relationships that we develop with some of our legislators and it, the government is so big and so complicated. We have the feeling sometimes that they don't have any idea who we are, but a good deal of our legislators have connections to ALS. And um, one of them in particular is Senator Murkowski from Alaska. She's been incredibly supportive, Kathy McMorris Rogers. And I think also Patty Murray because of her connection to the military. But the second year that we went um, to advocacy, I believe we had a personal meeting with Senator Murkowski, which is not common. I would say 90% of the time we meet with staffers, but occasionally we do get to meet with the members. And it was just a really wonderful meeting. She was so engaged. She has a cousin who had ALS, so she is particularly interested. The next year, we did not have a meeting with her her, but we had a meeting with her staffer and my daughter and I happened to be down in the tunnels between buildings and we saw her coming down the hall and I, and she was, she had this, uh, she had a black, beautiful black dress on. She's a very attractive, striking woman. And we made eye contact and she recognized us right away. She knew who we were. She came up to us, she said, oh my gosh, I can't be at the meeting today. I'm so sorry, I'm going to a funeral. What can I do for you? And honestly, one of the things that I've learned most about advocacy is developing these, these relationships um, and having that kind of support in the, in the Senate and the House has really made a difference for us. I'm not sure if it's because of the disease itself but we have really established some wonderful relationships with people. And Rebecca is a, as a result of that as well. She's been in contact with one of our advocates, Priscilla Bell, who lost her husband um, to ALS and has become involved in advocacy. And Rebecca's here because Priscilla developed a relationship with her. So we're, very, we're really thankful for the connections that we've been able to make. Thank you, Jean. But it, it is really important, and it's um, it's those local connections, and you don't have to travel to D.C. like Rebecca said. You can meet them in their district office, which is just as impactful. Okay, we are coming up to 10 till, so I am going to sign off. This will be recorded and shared on our social media platforms, but I want to thank everybody again for joining us, and many thanks to Abram and Jean and Rebecca for being here today. Thank you.